Hey everyone, Peter here. I just want to mention that we had a few issues during the recording this week, so you might notice some skipping around in this episode. We'll try and get it fixed for next episode, though. All right, enjoy the episode. Recorded live at Tox and Tasting Studios, it's the Clerical Errors Podcast, the podcast that shows you what's behind the collar. Let's go. Well, welcome to the Clerical Errors Podcast. I'm Bull Hagen. And I'm Burke. And the uh, Vicar app uh, 16.0 is here as well. You want to say hi? Hello. How's how's the things going with you? you, you enjoying your your uh, new digs? Yeah, we're adjusting. All right. He kind of has to say he likes it because I'm right here. <laughs> so and it's, uh, it's a pretty nice house. We we put the the vicar app to use already. He brought our beverage today. Oh boy, I'm waiting with bated breath. All right. Would you like to say what it is? So today I brought one of my favorite drinks of summer, as okay. we are you know leaving summer going into fall. So I hope you enjoy this two drinks in one, Arizona Arnold Palmer. It's oh. half tea, half lemonade. Oh yeah, nice. I'm I'm liking this. Look at that. Twenty three fluid ounces of awesomeness. And, and I, I thank you for for the the dedication to the show. You spent ninety nine cents on on these. <laughs> I love these though. These are actually one of Peter's favorites. All right, here we go. Oh yeah, nice big uh, twenty-three ounces. These are refreshing. Nice, tastes good. Yeah, those are good. All right. So, uh, Berg, what are you preaching on? Well, the text coming up is um, for Trinity eleven uh, for the one-year lectionary, and I believe the text is Luke eighteen, and it has to do with the uh, well, Vicar. What is the text? Luke 19. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Vicar, what's the text for uh, Trinity 11? Oh. I think we're looking at the uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan. I'm sorry. It is 18. Yep. You're right. Parable. No, this is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. All right. So, the, par- the parable of the Pharisee and the tax <laughs> We're firing collector. all cylinders today. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> um, so, Jesus tells this parable. Uh, because people think uh, that they're righteous and they show contempt for others. So that's the reason why he's telling this parable. This parable is pretty uh, straightforward in the sense that there's a Pharisee and there's a tax collector. The Pharisee is the kind of person you'd want in your church. He tithes a lot. Uh, he fasts. He looks like a really, really good member. Um, his yard looks nice, I bet. His, his yard looks immaculate. Mm-hmm. right? And then you've got the tax collector. The tax collector was hated. Uh, by Jewish society, um, because they would actually extort money from the taxpayers. So if the Romans wanted 10%, he would charge 15%. Then he'd pocket the 5% and, you know, give the rest to the Romans. That's why tax collectors were usually rich in Jesus' day. And so we see these two men, and you'd think that it'd be the Pharisee who'd be justified, Mm -hmm. would be declared righteous by God. But we see that it's the tax collector. Why? Not because he... uh, finds any righteousness in himself, but because he throws himself on the mercy of God. The word there, God be merciful to me, a sinner, uh, it's not really the same word for mercy. Actually, a better translation of it would be, God make atonement for me, a sinner. And uh, this should point us automatically to the death of Jesus, Mm -hmm. where God does make atonement for us through the blood of Christ. And that's why the parable, that's why the uh, the parable, the uh, the publican, the tax collector, goes to his house justified, right. and not the Pharisee. And uh, people use, uh, maybe listeners may not un- all, all understand the word justified, but but what, what do we mean? Vicar, what do we mean when we talk about someone is justified? If, if you're not, if someone isn't familiar with the word justified, how would you explain that word to them? I would say it's a, it's a courtroom uh, term that... Uh, God declares us justified, meaning God declares us righteous, and he does this on account of the work of Christ and his His death that atoned or paid for our sin. All right. So uh, I think it's easy for people to maybe moralize this and say, well, just don't be like the Pharisee who says, you know, thank you that I'm not like this guy, which would be, it's just kind of ironic because you're saying, well, 
thank thank goodness I like I'm not that Pharisee who was happy that he wasn't like the publican. I, I heard this from one of my buddies. He uh, <laughs> he was in church once, and the pastor had just got done preaching the sermon, and um, and then in the prayers he said, "Lord, thank you that we're not like this poor Pharisee <laughs> who was righteous in himself." <laughs> Ah, oh, just missing the point, man. <laughs> just missing the point. But it really is about about repentance and forgiveness and trusting in the mercy of God. That is is why you are how you're justified. You're forgiven is through the grace and mercy. And so I think it's it might be on the surface people might think, well, this is just don't be proud and don't think you're better than everybody else. When it's really really about recognizing your own sin. And uh, and trusting in the mercy of God rather than your own abilities and your own righteousness, because your own righteousness is not as righteous as you think it is. Right. This gets to a point that I think a lot of people have trouble with, that um, they think that unbelievers can do good works. OK, usually when they think of sin, they think of the real coarse sins, the ones that everybody condemns, even the world. Mm -hmm. um, but. That is what the law teaches us, that even our best and our brightest and our holiest works, apart from Christ, they are dirty rags. They are menstrual rags. They are disgusting. They are abominable in the eyes of God. Um, and that is why we need Christ. That anything that doesn't come from faith is actually sin. And, and that's what the Pharisee did not realize. Right. So, all right. Well, uh, that brings us to... Bull Hagen's Top 12. Peter, play the intro. Enough nonsense. It's time for Bull Hagen's Top 12. So, Vickery, you still liking this music? <laughs> I'm digging it. <laughs> Round two. <laughs> yeah. This is always a fun part for me when I talk about the music. I just like the music. <laughs> you are a music lover. So, my Top 12 is this. You know, I was uh, thinking about uh, uh, the elderly. That's one thing that a lot of pastors can be ex experts on. Yeah, a lot of the people we see on a very regular basis uh, and have a lot of intimate uh, conversation with is are our elderly members. And, and, and many times we actually see see the elderly people more than their own families do. Mm -hmm. You know, so so and then I was also thinking that in terms of for me that I just miss a lot of our elderly. You know, we've. Uh, you know, in my 17 years where I am, I've had so many funerals, and, and what a joy it is to pronounce that they are alive in Christ forever. But there doesn't isn't a day go by where I don't think about them. Right. You know, and, and, and consider uh, these jewels of the church that uh, preserve the word for the current generation and all the things that they go through and the wonderful stories of faith that, that uh, I've only heard. Right. You know, that's one thing I want to do sometime is I, I've got this hand recorder that I got for uh, recording at the convention. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm thinking about just taking that to some of our elderly members and just give them a chance to say some of those things that I hear that we all could learn from. Right. And uh, and, and pass it on to the, the next generation. So I might do that. Would you be game for me going doing that some of that too? Yeah, that'd be awesome. You know, because we have so many of those. So... So my top 12 list is this, uh, the top 12 ways to show kindness and respect to our elderly. Number 12. Visit them. Visit them. Absolutely. You know, it doesn't take much of your time, and even just a few minutes to go in and see them really brightens their day, because most of them are very, very lonely. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they're in some like facilities, like a nursing home, a lot of the people that they're surrounded with maybe don't have their minds anymore. Yeah. And so they really have no one to talk to. They have no one to um, to see. Or so. sometimes they wind up just talking past each other because they can't hear very well or understand each other very well. Right. And, uh, you know, a lot of times as a pastor, we just go and we just sit there and listen and say, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm -hmm, yep. mm -hmm, which is which is fine. Uh, but simply visiting them is, is a way to show care and respect for them. Number 11. Find ways for them to help the church that takes into consideration their limitations. Yeah, that's a great one. Do you have like any examples? Um, well, some might be uh, folding 
bulletins. Mm-hmm. Some maybe they can make cookies, but they can't really get them to church. Right. You know, but but you know, one thing when they have limitations, they can't do the things that they used to be able to do. They don't. A lot of times, they don't think of themselves. They think of they feel bad for the people that they helped that they can't help any longer. Mm-hmm. And they still want to be able to do something. They have such a servant's heart that uh, they can't get around very much, very well anymore. And so, um, so they can't, that, that bothers them. Not so, just because they like to get out, but there are people that they want to help. There are mm-hmm. people that they want to visit. And uh, um, sometimes, you know, maybe it's, uh, I know our ladies, some might crochet a, a blanket or they'll work on a, a quilting thing and then send it along or something like that. But there's, you know, fine, because that's what they really want to do. That's what brings them joy is to, they really have a strong sense of what it means to live for somebody else and the fulfillment that that brings. And and they understand it more than our own generation by leaps and bounds that, you know, you know our generation is... Is I guess I should say your generation and my generation because I'm quite a bit older than. Ha, ah. but uh, you know it's about uh, how can I live my own fulfilled life? You know, very quick to talk about my dreams. This is what I want to do in my life. This is the kind of car I want to drive, and uh, you know the elderly think completely in, in different terms. They think of you know who is it that I can help? Yep. And and, and from my a- end. That it sometimes it makes people in our own generation seem awfully trite and self-interested. When you if you spend a, a day a, a day of uh, visiting uh, the elderly and then you talk some to some other folks and it just is it's almost shocking what you notice, wouldn't you say? I would agree. Number ten, learn from their examples of faith. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's one wonderful thing that the, uh, that why God has given us the church. So that way the older women can help the younger women. The mm-hmm. older men can provide a, uh, a good and godly example for the younger men. And, and uh, to, to learn from them in the sense, too, that, uh, you know, they were a very strong generation. And we talk about the, the, those who are in their 90s. You think of all the things that they went through in their life and how, how they couldn't have made it through certain things without their faith and how they... Well, and I would even say, too, like, look at how they beautified their church buildings. Mm -hmm. They spent a lot of money and time and effort uh, beautifying these buildings when they themselves were, with respect to today, fairly poor, Mm -hmm. right? They did care about uh, the church. They did care about beautifying God's house where his word is preached and his sacraments are administered. I would think that if you looked at... um, uh, how we beautify churches today, that that is an inverse of how nice our houses are. Okay. You know, that our houses are way nicer. We've got a lot nicer stuff in our own homes, but then for the church of God, it's like, oh, well, I'm going to go to the Dollar General and get, you know, the cheapest thing I possibly can. Right. And you could also, you know, you hear stories about... uh, um the kind of sacrifice it was to get to church on Sunday mornings. Yeah, well, you, well, we, our congregation history with that, because originally, our two congregations were one congregation, and but at Beads Lake, mm-hmm. and that's a long way to go by horse, uh, right. from Latimer or even from Hampton. And you guys actually moved to town, and the nurses had no way of traveling out to the country, right? And so they actually reorganized here in Hampton. Which is why you guys are probably like thirty years younger than us in that way, mm-hmm. uh, because you reorganized uh, for the sake of these of these uh, uh, nurses, so that way they could hear the gospel, which is awesome. But do you think of of the all the chores that they had to get done, you know, when they had five different animals to take care of, right? You know, cows to milk, and and uh, it really was quite a sacrifice for them to get to church, right? And, and they made it. And they made it. And not only that, there's, is uh, they dressed up for it. They dressed up for it, and and you didn't take, couldn't find too many excuses. Right. So, so that it just learn from their ex- faith because, because, you know, that that's about the many people that, you know, we've lost that heaven that the kingdom of God has gained. Right. And it's like 
you can't come to church. You can't see. I don't want you on the road. Right. So we'll bring the church to you. Number nine. Respect those sayings that are important to them. Okay. Keep keep going with that? Yep. Uh, well, you know, um, uh, they have some things that are very important to them that seem kind of strange to us. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it's um, collecting Kulip containers. Yep. You know, or whatever the case may be. They have a lot of things that they really do care deeply about, and and a lot of times they just get dismissed. Yeah, my grand, my great grandpa, who's now in heaven, uh, we couldn't turn turn it from the Weather Channel. <laughs> he would actually sit there and watch it and be like, "Okay, it's only about nine and a half minutes before the radar changes." But that's what was important to him on and how the crops were going to grow. Number eight, show love to them as they are, understanding that with age, certain things change. Mm-hmm. So, for example, there are times where they just don't have as much tact. Yes. And and that's an age thing. Or there are times where they struggle, like something bothers them, and they just have trouble letting things go. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that's an age thing. Sometimes it isn't. But a lot of times it is. It just, they want to let things go, but they just have trouble doing it. Right. You know? And, uh, and so the more you understand, well, that's who they are, and I'm going to love them, the more it's easier to understand and and help them that yep love them warts and all yeah because uh because as you age you know sometimes you know you can't hide your warts like we can <laughs> yeah you sort of lose the ability mm-hmm. so and it's not cute like babies right number seven eat with them yes i've, I've noticed that for them eating with them is more of a communal thing than it is now mm-hmm Right now, you know, when you're younger, you just eat to feed your body. Well, and I mean, think about the place where most people hang out. Like, I know when we have gatherings and stuff, where do people hang out? They hang out in the kitchen, right? And not only that, but uh, that generation, like you look at the women for that generation, they always had enough food um, to feed an army, right? Because they never knew who was going to stop by, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, So for them, eating is... uh, it's it's a it's a communal thing. It's a very important thing to them. It it is a necessary cog in their life, where for us it's all fast food and you know, you know, uh, watching Netflix while we while we eat. And so. and and for some, there when you go visit them, there's very few things in life that brings them joy, like that you eating something that they baked or cooked for you. Right. You know that just brings them a lot of joy. So yep. And remember, pastors, you can always go, you know, run around the section later. Right. So. I try to measure my lunch by whom I, I visit. So, you know, if I'm going to see someone, I'll say, oh, I'll just have some water. Yep. So I'll have, I'll have, I'll have, about, I'll have some chicken broth today. Right. Because I know I'm going to have about four brownies, a cookie, a donut, and about eight cups of coffee mm-hmm. today. Number six. Slow down. Yeah. Um, they are used to a slower paced life. Yep. And sometimes just sitting with them, you don't even have to say anything, just means a lot. Yep. Smell the roses, speak slowly, enunciate. Mm-hmm. I wish more people would do that. Even for me, I'm not even that old. And, you know, I just, I don't think people appreciate the, you know, words. They don't appreciate the conversation. And And, and they're used to, to times where, on any given night, a neighbor would just stop by and they would play cards for three hours, you know, where they would just spend a lot of time with neighbors and friends, just even on the spur of the moment. Nowadays, well, did you text first? Did you call? We got to organize three weeks in advance. Right. And, and and that kind of thing. Well, they were just used to, well, so-and-so stop by and, you know. The porch light is on, so we can go. Right. Number five. Uh, children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Please know that your faith matters to your great grandparents more than you could ever imagine. Amen. We've done a few episodes. What keeps pastors awake at night? What keeps uh, pastors' wives awake at night? Well, guess what keeps the elderly awake at night? Wondering if their children, their grandchildren, and their great grandchildren are Christians. So go to church. You know, you see that on Mother's Day and Father's Day when. 
the, the their sons or daughters will go with them to church and they're just beaming. Mhm. They love it. Because it, it means a lot to them that you are there. And uh you know, because they're the you are the one thing that hopefully they'll have with them in heaven. Mhm. They won't have the land, they won't have the tractors, they won't have the fishing gear, none of that nonsense. So every, hopefully you'll be there. And I know this from experience because uh, every once in a while and when I'm visiting, I'll say, when I pray, I say, do you have any prayer requests that you want me to include in the prayer? And guess what 70% of the prayer requests are for? For this very thing. This very thing. So it really does matter to them. So please, please, uh, for your own sake, you know, as well, but show respect for your grandparents who who think of all the, the times, you know, your parents made sure you were in church and how much it mattered to them and... And uh, um, when we think as pastors, when we think of the church, we think in terms of generations. Right. You know, you, you teach confirmation kids and knowing that they're going to be parents someday. Yeah, I mean, we teach for the long view. Like, we don't have a five-year plan. We have like a 150-year plan. Number four, speak up for them and watch out for them. Because a lot of times uh, you want to make sure they're good in nursing home. Right. You want to you want to make sure um, that uh, topic hospice care, you know. Um, right. You don't want to make you don't want them to get old. There are a lot of scams that target the elderly. A lot of them. Yeah. Because, so, you know, I've had it one time where I was I was visiting with one of our elderly members and uh, she was saying, well, um, I'm getting new insurance on the house. And said, oh, really? She goes, I don't know. I was really happy with the other place, but this person came to my house and were so nice about it and basically was scamming them into changing insurance. Right. And when they came, I told them to, I actually came when I was there and I told them to leave because they were even from our own town. They're from Des Moines and they were, I think, taking advantage of them probably, but right. they, they were they're so kind and anybody that was hard for them just to say no. Right. And, uh, and and uh, people take watch out for them and speak up for them, you know these are, you know the the precious jewels of our churches and our families, and uh, it's speak up for them, because you know where would we be without them? Number three, write to them. Love getting mail. They love getting letters. Um, even if you can't write well, if your handwriting is terrible, print it off in like fourteen font or whatever. If they're if they have bad eyesight or whatever, mm -hmm. but just just write to them. They love that because they keep them. They have us, you know, and they read them over and over again. And I guess one 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 thing you can do is is generally see how they show love to you, and then uh, and then give them the same kind of love back. Because when they, they they show, if they write you a Christmas card or something like that, and or they write you a personal note. That's how they show love in a way that's really meaningful to them. Well, if you do the same back, it's really going to mean a lot to them. And uh, we take that for granted because we'll, we, we send text messages. Uh, they don't, don't do that. Uh, now they have cell phones. Sometimes they're even on Facebook. You know? But really, really heartfelt, handwritten letter or word really does mean a lot to them. I'm sure you've seen that too, Berg. Yep, that's the truth. Number two. Uh, inform the pastor how they are doing if they're in their family. Right. And let them know if they can use a visit. Let them know when they're having surgery and all those things. Yeah. You know, this show is about what's behind the collar. And here's a, maybe, you know, a, a carefully guarded secret. Pastors don't have ESP. We can't actually read your minds. We don't know what's going on unless you guys tell us. We can't go visit somebody if they're having surgery or in the hospital if you don't let us know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if someone's having a rough time, we don't know unless you tell us. Yeah. And so, yeah, just let us know because we don't often know. And, uh, you know, when it comes to your own family, speak up for them in that way as well. It's too busy. Uh, don't listen because this is our, this is why we're here. James, People of the previous generations, you know, don't want to be an inconvenience or a burden, but that's exactly why we're here. Yeah, and it comes it comes from a servant's heart. These other people really need him too. Yeah, sometimes I think though, like 
they don't want I think the the flip side of that though they want to be so helpful but the temptation there is they don't want to be a burden but sometimes God makes us into burdens so that way we can do so that way other people can do good works right right that's the thing you shouldn't shy away from being a burden if God takes away your physical or mental capabilities because God is using that so that way other people can do good works for you right if I mean we're pastors because we like to visit you know right that's it's part of the reason why we're here we, we can go that's I always sometimes think this is kind of a Ponzi scheme where we can go out we can spend like an entire afternoon making and drinking coffee and we can say yep that was my day at work yep <laughs> it's, it's tiring blessing. it's very tiring sometimes but uh and it seems like there are no tangible benefits and there aren't and, and you it, know and, except for the waistline gets bigger but <laughs> <laughs> um, but <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm going to laugh really hard when I re-listen to this because sometimes, you know me, I'm not always <laughs> focused on every word. So, any <laughs> tangible benefits, the forgiveness of sins, the comfort. I mean, those things we just can't even calculate. So, and, and we treasure the time we spend with you too. Yes. So, so for our own sakes, do for your pastor's sake, you, you know, do those things. Right. Give us a call. And number one. All right, and this brings us to number one. And I want to dedicate number one to someone special. I want to dedicate this to my mother. Make sure you give them hugs. <laughs> they like hugs. Yep. So I would encourage now, you know, just don't go around hugging everybody. But, you know, there are some times where you're dealing with a mother, a grandmother, who their whole life has been tactile and caring. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, you see a, a visit a widow, like in your family, or say your, your mother or your grandmother, they really crave a good hug once in a while. Right. It really is true. Um, and so so give them a good hug once in a while. Okay. All right, now, now I'm not necessarily giving always advice for pastors because, you know, there are all sorts of... Yeah. You know. Yep. You I know. Do. But, uh, but they do need hugs. They really yep. do. Or, you know, to give them a nice hand squeeze, you know, just something, you know. Right. Um, that's why a lot of them have stuffed animals mm -hmm. in the nursing home. They have something to hold. They've yeah. got, you know, they they desire that touch, but they can't get it from anywhere. Right. So, so boys, give your moms a hug. Give your grandma a hug. Give your great-grandma a good hug once in a while. And uh, they really do... They really do appreciate that they, more than you you could actually think. They really do. So, all right, that's my top twelve list. If you have any uh, more to add, where can they get a hold of us, Vicar? They can find us at on Facebook at Clerical Errors, uh -huh. Twitter Clerical Errors P, right? They can email us at feedback at Clerical Errors, right? They can you can email us at Arizona Light Half and Half Iced Tea Lemonade that's at a, Clerical Errors. That's a new one. Dot org. Men. Why is it that men know less theology than their fathers and grandfathers? It's time to man up America with the Clerical Heirs Podcast. An all-natural theology booster can help you feel like the real men that made the church great. With this tea booster, you can feel more confident in the divine service or in Bible study. So what are you waiting for? Send your questions and comments and concerns to theologybooster at clericalheirs.org. That's theologybooster at clericalheirs.org. And fellas, she'll like the podcast too. These claims have not been verified by the CTCR of the LCMS. Please consult your pastor before using. If results are too intense, listen to a different podcast. All right, that brings us to Berg's Bodacious Blasphemies. Peter, play the intro. Berg's Bodacious Blasphemies is the part of the show where Berg seeks to sell you ancient damn delusions by repackaging them for modern consumption. In short, Berg makes bad stuff sound bodacious. All right, this blasphemy is called Shaming the Sufferer. We all know about this. I, I went around for a couple different... Yeah, I went around in my head about what it, what to title this. I thought about, you know, the blasphemy of the silver bullet. 
because sometimes as pastors, you know, we, um, you know, we really judge people kind of harshly um, sometimes um, when they don't do everything right, mm-hmm. you know, um, and especially younger pastors, like uh, when they come out and do things, then we ask the question, well, what did he do wrong? Right. Mm-hmm. You know, and so um, this uh, this kind of dovetails with your with your talk about old people, right? The elderly, um, because there are a lot of people in the church who suffer from things. They see the evil, they see the corruption, and they want to make things better. They just might not always go about it always the right way. So here we go. Let's not forget the church struggler, the person who, in the interest of the church of Jesus, is fighting a battle against the odds. It's easy to see the struggler and to find little flaws in his work, He battles and often misses the mark. He runs and often stumbles. And we generally see his missing the mark, and we see him shooting too far. We don't care to see the aim he is shooting at, the goal he is eagerly stretching forward to. Even the best football player, in his eagerness and enthusiasm working for the greater glory of his alma mater, fumbles the ball in the fatal minute of the play. And there are few that see the fellow's eagerness. There are many that see only the fumbled ball and the cry of disappointment and anger rises towards heaven. The church is still a great battleground, and there are still men and women that delight in the struggle. But there are also people that delight in useless, killing, enfeebling, soul-crushing work of opposition, in discouragement and in fault-finding. The church struggler needs, above all, a little cheer, a little appreciation, a little understanding. Don't for a moment believe that because every Christian must bear a cross that you have been designated to become that cross for him or her. To be sure, we are still in this world. The church worships the successful, the well-satisfied men and women that do not speak on the Laodicean condition, the lukewarmness of the church as a whole and of our own life in particular. If then you suddenly hear the voice of the struggler, the person that again is realizing that he must struggle his way into the kingdom, and if he or she then calls to other, calls others to that same struggle, it's very easy and it's very natural natural for us to shout, away with him, away with her, and it is easy, give us the men and women of success. If you and I see a struggler fighting any kind of a church battle, we are privileged to preach a great sermon to them. Anyone can cry, down, but it is just a little harder to say, bravo, fight the good fight of faith, my brother, my sister. Oh, I like that. Of course, you always bring a strong Berg. It's the way we roll, man. <laughs> so, so, so this is to to someone who is, you know, fighting for the faith, and 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 people like to just bring them down. Is that? Yeah. So, if someone's struggling for the faith, they're having a hard time of it, seeking to understand. Um, but then they get discouraged. They mm-hmm. try and then they fail. Um, they and they might not always do things in a way that we would think of as correct, right? Mm-hmm. But rather than seeing the struggle and seeing the enthusiasm, just like with the football player, all we look at is the fumbled ball, right? Right. We don't see uh, how hard it was and how much they they struggle they struggled and strove uh, to try and make that play work, mm-hmm. but then it all just came apart. Right. Mm-hmm. Sometimes from no fault of their own. So, so are you talking, you know, just uh, someone in the church? Are you talking about the work of a pastor? Is it a little bit of both? That I, you're... I, I think it, it's everybody. Um, you know, you've got pastors who feel this way, who struggle and strive, especially young pastors who feel inexperienced, um, and who try to do things and maybe don't always do them correctly. Right. But they, um, they, but it's an exuberance for the gospel. Right. And you also have people in the church, people who want the gospel to go out. They want people to be saved. Uh, and then they they fail, right? They maybe don't always, you know, uh, do things completely or express themselves. That's a better one. They don't express themselves maybe as doctrinally correct as we would want them to, mm-hmm. you know? And so we critique that. And, you know, we're all trying to be better, right? Right, right. And we should. But I think sometimes we lose their enthusiasm and their intent, and we just say, well, you could have said it better this way, which is true. 
But okay. at the same time, it's like, you know. It, it kind of reminds me of, uh, you know, we've you, you've started this talks and tastings thing, and which has gone off amazingly. And we've had a lot of, you've had a lot of people come to those. Mm-hmm. And it's been, it's been awesome. I think well, that was one of the springboards we had for this podcast, really. Right. And uh, I think everyone was surprised. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Because, we, you know, when it comes to doing things like that within the church, it's kind of like baseball. You kind of bat around things and... And and we spend a lot of time motivating, you know, trying to get things off the ground and try different ways. And quite honest, it's easy to get discouraged because a good percent. And, you know, you try to do things. You try to get things going and it just, it all seems to fall apart. Then you ask the question, well, what am I really even doing here? Mm -hmm. You know, is any of this work any good? And this, and this is true of pastors. It's true of, um, of uh, parents, right? Mm -hmm. You try one thing to get it to work, you know. It's true. It's a Sunday school, when Sunday school tries to get things, and then, you know, you plan an event, and then all of a sudden, well, there's some sort of a football event, and mm -hmm. and you'll have one person there. You know, that kind of things happens probably, probably are unsuccessful, that they are successful in a lot of ways. Right, you know, and so that's the thing. It's like, let's, uh, I don't know, there's always room for improvement, and mm -hmm. for getting better. But let's not enthusiasm and love for the gospel. Because I I mean, I see the opposite of that. It seems like people are, they don't say anything at all. Right. They're so afraid of struggling in the wrong way or of fumbling the ball, you know, to use the football analogy. And that's that's not what Christians do. And and, it's, and I like one thing that you mentioned too is, is this, is I, I do believe that if everyone in a congregational setting, pastor and people alike, when, and, and if they all realize that everybody really does want the same thing, you, that uh, you might sometimes disagree in how you're, you're getting there. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I think, do think that, you know, people want more people to hear the gospel. Right. They, they want, you know, they want people to, to have uh, the forgiveness, life, and salvation that Jesus came to bring. But, and so if you, you go with that understanding that, but you might disagree in how you do it, but then cut each other some slack. Demonize. I mean, right. it's just, that's not what Christians do. I mean, to be right, that's of the devil. That's, that's not what we're, that's not what we're about. And then that's also then what points us back to sacraments because that, you know, you get discouraged if you don't have those, because I know that every, to me, not be the, the best word to use, but uh, that, that bats a thousand, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, that's something you know that you are receiving the body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. You know that pronounce your sins are forgiven. That's as if Jesus Christ himself is saying those words. You know the power of, of, of your own baptism, uh, and you know the power of God's word, that he is, his word does what it says. So when it comes to those things, those things, those things don't fail. And right. those are what Jesus himself, he gave us. If you think about you know, his last will and testament, you know, the night before he died, and the kind of things he emphasized to his disciples when he rose, go and make disciples, baptizing them, you know, uh, peace I give you, and then tells them to when you forgive someone their sins, it is forgiven in heaven. And I think, too, it's those very things that actually create the church struggler mm -hmm. because the church, the sin, he sees the sin in himself, he sees the sin in the church, he sees the sin in the world, and that only, and so that's the thing is that, um, if you're a struggler, don't struggle, right? right. Embrace it. And, and know this. Fight the good fight. You're your pastor, generally, yeah. way. But also, we appreciate anyone who isn't showing apathy. <laughs> right. Well, it's like the thing talked about, the Laodicean, uh, this sort of lukewarmness in the church, this complacency. Um, you know, it that is a real problem. And uh, so, yeah, we are, we are excited and we are... Uh, just, yeah, we love to hear, you know, it probably sounds terrible, right? We love to hear your problems, <laughs> but we do um, because th we then we see the Spirit of God in work through his word in your heart, right? Mm -hmm. And in your mind that you're actually struggling with a lot of the same things we struggle with mm -hmm. day, in, day in and day out. And, uh, I mean, I, I guess I don't mean to open up a can of worms, but I'm going to. Go for it, man. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that is that what's your way? I think in some ways the church has failed on a certain issue, mm -hmm. and that is this is uh, is when it comes to homosexuality, right? Because there is no has, in previous times there was no concern about someone who maybe struggled with certain temptations, 
Right. You you just castigate them. Oh, your temptations are to me or to us. Mm-hmm. And even when they're they're struggling fiercely against these desires, um, you know, we we do. We what's the proper response? Well, to show them love, right? And what kind of love is that? Well, Let's to see. remember to point out their sin, but also to point them to their savior. Because if they're struggling with it, the law is already you know doing its work, mm-hmm. right? Um, and what they need is the gospel, right? And and I and I do. Wouldn't you say though, in in in, in previous generations, that we could say that's one where the, I think the church, in a way, dropped the ball. Where where the mm-hmm. yeah, I mean. And I even look at where I grew up in the United States. Um, you look at how some of the older people talked about people who weren't married. Um, that, you know, if you weren't married by a certain age, there was either something wrong with your head or wrong right. somewhere else, right? Um, which has, you know, which not only uh, puts down, you know, well, really makes fun of homosexuals, but it also kind of puts a bad light on things like chastity. Or mm-hmm. virginity that some people are eunuchs for the kingdom of God. Yeah, and and so I just bring that up because there there's a a way that people could be suffering and and real warriors when it comes to faith, right? And 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 sinful desires, and and they could be, you know, especially if when it comes to as a church, if you're not if you're not consistent, right. This, with, take, this takes us back to the Pharisee and the tax collector, right? You're not better than the homosexual. You're right. not. You're not. Your sin is different, but all sin damns. Right. And Christ died for the sin of homosexuality, just as he died for your sin of pride or lust or greed or covetousness or whatever, right? And so that's the thing is like, you have the same grace, you have the same Christ, you have the same God. Um, so when you, when they tell you things like this, you know, you know, the sin in your own heart, you know, it's, (laughs) you're no better. That's the thing. And in fact, you're, you know, in a lot of ways worse. So be patient with them, be kind with them, be merciful to them, right? Pity, you know, pity them just as God pitied you. You know, and, and one thing that we preach all the time is this, is that, as as a, a baptized child of God, that is how you're defined. You're not defined by your sin or your sinful temptations. That's a big lie in that issue that have been sold. This is your identity, right? When what is your identity? Well, I'm baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. His name was written on on me, right? And that's why too, talking about end of life stuff, just on your gravestones, right? What should be on there? Should it be pictures of farms? Did that define you? How about your children? Did they define you? No. At the end of the day, the thing that defines you is Christ, Christ. right? Your faith in him. And those are the things that you should have on your gravestone, not all these other things, not beer cans, not tractors, not fields, because you know what? None of that stuff matters. And then that, that, I guess, you know, going back to, to my, you know, my, the can of worms that I said I was going to open is that's one thing that came to mind is, is that. Right. Is is because you know there are think of the immense pressure they they might face, you know, in a world that really pushes hard on them to to go another direction. Right, and the shame because they do feel God's law, and they feel its sharpness probably more than most of us. Right, do. and so so as a church, sometimes if you you're asking them to to walk a very fine line of loneliness in the sense of, and and this is obviously God's word. Right. You know, but at the same time, okay, reject the the really loud noises that around this world that tell you that to uh, to that this is who you are to embrace it and 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 then and then if the church isn't supportive on the other hand, right, and they 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 say, well, I'm going to kind of in a sense judge your suffering in this issue, then that just think how lonely that would be. Right. I mean, the church is here to bring forgiveness, life, and salvation, and and comfort, mm-hmm. and and and. I do think, and you know, we do have a history of of doing just what you said, right? And so, yeah. Any thoughts, comments, questions? Vicar, talk to you about all the places to send that stuff. So, <laughs> all right, that brings us to the in, 
uh, attention. Uh, <laughs> the concentrationally impaired Bible study. Peter, play the intro. Do you have impaired concentration? Then this is for you. It's the impaired concentration Bible study. One verse, one verse only. So, uh, hey, Vicar. Um, shiny new Vicar app 16.0. What is Obadiah verse 20? Obadiah verse 20. The exiles of this host of the people of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zarephah, and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sepharad shall possess the cities of the Negev. <laughs> How you doing, Berg? <laughs> I'm doing all right. Um, all right. So... Okay, so once again... It's not really not fair that I just stare at you. That really isn't fair for me. It's so, like... Uh, so it goes. Um, <laughs> once again, we get into this question of geography, right? Mm-hmm. And you have this this switch, right? Those who are captives will be captors, right? Mm-hmm. And those who are captors will, be, will become captives, right? Just like Mary's Magnificat. Um, the land of the Canaanites, these people who oppressed and took these people into slavery. Uh, Their land shall be um, taken over by the Israelites, right? Those that they led into captivity. Um, And even to as far as Zarephath, um, this is the place where Elisha met with the widow, right? It's outside of the bounds of Israel, and it's in the extreme north. So we're talking about a huge area here. And the captivity of Jerusalem, which was taken either to Sardis or Sparta, shall possess the cities of the Negev, uh, or the cities of the south, which is given as kind of a representation of the nations nearby. So, theologically, what is this talking about? This is talking about the church militant, the church, the fighting church that suffers here and that is uh, that is enslaved here and made captive here, uh, that is led away into exile here, uh, shall become the church triumphant. And we see this finally at the end of time, when our Lord Jesus will come back uh, and give us a... Um, a, a general judgment, right? And those uh, saints who were killed and slaughtered and uh, suffered, you know, were mocked and scorned here, uh, shall be lifted up, and their captors will be put down. All right. I, I, Vicar, do you have anything to add to that? <laughs> no, that was wonderful. All right. Well, uh, that's all we have for today. No doubt. So for our sticky notes, um, before... Vicar 15.0 left, uh, had an opportunity for people to leave some advice for the outgoing vicar. And this was uh, recorded at the, the last Talks and Tasting. So um, so uh, now that uh, Vicar 15.0 is in the recycle bin, uh, we thought... <laughs> <laughs> so that is your name for the seminary. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we're doing. So... Uh, um, so as we'll close with that, so um, you can listen to that after after we sign off. So thank you for listening. I'm Bullhagen. And I'm Berg. Uh, always make sure you spay and neuter your pets. Fifth Amendment. <laughs> Forget everything you learned from Pastor Bullhagen. Run fast! <laughs> uh, advice. You want to give good advice when you give advice. Yep. It's not too late to get out. Don't die. <laughs> he survived and he's done well. All right. Downsize. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, make sure you listen to your mentor. Don't try this at home. Vicar, don't do that. Don't be a circumcellion. Don't pee on an electric fence. Thank you for joining us. This podcast is available on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Questions, thoughts, concerns? You can contact us on Facebook at facebook.com slash podcast. On Twitter, at P for podcast, or email us at feedback at clericalheirs.org. Thanks for listening to Clerical Heirs. See you next time.